I think in the future learning will be more open and more accessible and more varied so that more people are able to learn in different ways and in di for different purposes across the lifespan so that learning will be life wide and lifelong. We might argue that learning has always been available, but often it was available in fairly, fairly narrow forms and to perhaps only a small section of the population worldwide. Um, learning will be more accessible, more open and more available freely to everyone at any time and for any reason. There will be big changes in, in learning that will, that will come down the line. And some of that is around the, the, the structures that we have in terms of a, a degree, looking at micro-credentials, just-in-time training, um, and the way that education might get, is getting, I suppose, packaged into, into smaller kind of samples. The future of learning is uh, uh, online and digital because we need to uh, follow the, and adapt to and be proactive with the UNESCO and the United Nations uh, development goals, especially in education, number four but also that, that the SDG 4 have influences and impact on all the other SDGs. And the only way forward is online uh, to reach the education for all. So the future of learning is um, likely to be much more flexible, more blended, more hybrid across the continuum of formal and informal learning. I think in terms of the process and uh, who is involved in the learning process, I think we're going to see many more, in, many more stakeholders involved. So it will be in higher education, academics working with learning designers and other stakeholders to make learning more engaging and especially as it goes more online. Imagine a world where the highest quality learning is open to all, regardless of status, location or circumstances. That's what we're building. We're FutureLearn. Our purpose is to transform access to education. We're jointly owned by the Open University and the SEEK Group, world leaders in distance education and employment businesses. We've reached over 10 million learners to date. We're a multi-award winning team with the skills, passion and plan to deliver the best online learning experience. We offer a huge selection of courses from over 175 leading universities and organizational partners all over the world. We make learning simple, one step at a time on mobile, tablet and desktop, so you can fit your learning around your life. And we underpin it all with social learning. What's social learning? Put simply, it's harnessing the power of the community. We learn best when we share and debate ideas with fellow learners, understanding different experiences and perspectives, filling the gaps in our own knowledge. It adds an entirely new dimension and creates a richer learning experience. We make all this happen with flexible short courses, programs, micro-credentials and degrees. Each course is created by a leading university or organisation and made up of bite-sized lessons you can usually start learning for free. Short course upgrades offer access to all course materials and the chance to earn a certificate. Our unlimited offer allows you to pay once a year to upgrade on as many courses as you like. Paid courses offer a more focused, professionally orientated learning community. Sponsored courses help organizations widen participation in higher education or meet responsibility goals. Our programs enable you to learn in depth with groups of courses that help you explore different aspects of a topic. Our micro-credentials allow you to upskill or reskill with short stackable courses that award academic credit or recognition of prior learning. We offer a growing range of accredited undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. Degrees are arranged as sets of courses which you can take flexibly depending on how much time you want to commit each term. We also support our academic partners, public bodies and various organisations with a range of extra services. These include course creation, quick authoring for faster course development and improved learning design, plus end-to-end -end support from your own dedicated team. 
course analytics to better understand your learner demographics and what they think of your courses. Learner management. Guide cohorts with powerful course facilitation tools. Track and support individual learners. Income generation. A revenue share of paid courses and upgrades, as well as tools to attract learners to further study with your organisation. Employers can also use FutureLearn in the workplace to upskill or reskill employees. FutureLearn, transforming access to education. As a learning designer at FutureLearn, it's fair to say that I love learning. And from a design perspective, I love to see courses with a good mix of step types and learning types, the ways in which learners can interact and engage with the course material and each other. A course I love that does this really well is A History of Rural Food and Feasting. It's by the University of Reading. It presents historical accounts, gives learners choice and space to explore with lots of extra resources. It fosters discussion about contemporary attitudes to food and feasting and has a really strong narrative. It keeps you engaged, you're aware of what's coming up and you're excited to move through the course. I particularly love the innovative ways in which the team have encouraged learner production. The course has even got recipes so you can try them out at home, which is just a brilliant way to get people involved. They have examples of recipes to make and then they can share their experience and pictures on a Padlet wall. This is such a great way to encourage social learning experience. I'm a big fan of this course called Becoming a Better Music Teacher from the ABRSM. It's been hugely popular with music teachers from all over the world and I think one particular step demonstrates why. Early on in the course, the instructors introduced the concept of a teaching philosophy, basically the core principles that lie at the heart of someone's approach to teaching. They then used the discussion step to ask learners to share their own personal teaching philosophies. It's a course aimed at teaching professionals, and most teachers I know love to talk about their professional practice. So as you can imagine, the question elicits some rich responses. These are a few responses from music teachers taking the course. My philosophy is to inspire a love of music through self-expression instead of aiming to achieve perfect technicality. Music should be fun and pupils love doing it. Pupils will only be motivated to improve if they have a genuine love of what they're doing. My new philosophy is to build the skills of students to read music in the same way they would read their favourite book. This starts with teaching them how to read music, then exploring the story of each musical piece. My teaching philosophy is to inspire pupils of all ages, my instruction is always tailored to the individual needs of the pupil. I enjoy the challenge of making my lessons interesting and fun and being part of their musical journey. But as you can see, the engagement from these teachers is very high, making it a fantastic example of social learning as well as an opportunity for individual reflection. My favourite FutureLearn course that I've done was called Gravity, the Big Bang, Black Holes and Gravitational Waves by Parry Diderot. I actually did this course a couple of years ago but because it was presented in such an interesting way, it's really stuck in my mind. I love learning more about physics and our universe, and for me this course was special because it was packed with such engaging and sometimes very funny videos that really helped me understand the material. So for example, in this step looking at the law of falling bodies, the lead educator uses a mixture of special effects real-time experiments and traditional classroom techniques, so I think he uses a whiteboard to bring physics to life. You really feel like you're in a personal classroom with him, just with the added benefit of a green screen. You don't feel like you're being lectured to, it's more like you're having a really engaging conversation, and that's the reason I'll remember the course for years to come. My favourite course on the FutureLearn platform is called Genomic Medicine Transforming Patient Care in Diabetes from the University of Exeter. As a type 1 diabetic myself, I found this course really informative. When I was diagnosed at 16, type 1 diabetes was only ever explained to me at a very basic level, and access to this course meant that I could learn so much more about my condition that I never even knew. The social learning community on this course is made up of a mixture of healthcare professionals and people who either have type 1 diabetes themselves or have someone close to them affected by the condition. I particularly appreciated the patient's stories throughout the course, and I found Dan's story in week 2 particularly memorable, as we were diagnosed at the same age, and I could really relate to this story. I'm really thankful that this course exists on the platform and is a resource for people across the world living with diabetes. I love learning that helps connect an online course to things I can show people easily and help them see why the topic I'm studying is fun and engaging. 
I'm quite digital and a bit of a paperphobe, so it may surprise people when I say one of my favourite courses on FutureLearn is Flexagons and the Math Behind Twisted Paper with Yossi Alran from the Weizmann Institute of Science. Yossi has a wonderful ability to bridge that awkward gap between the digital platform of FutureLearn with our own world by using just colourful pieces of paper. Several parts of the course encourage learners to leave the platform in order to print out templates of folding paper that help explain complex mathematics and the curious minds of mathematicians. Look, it's a folding piece of paper. The purpose is to talk about the way these mathematical marvels work and why they have captured people's imaginations for many years. They even inspired Richard Feynman's work that led to a Nobel Prize. I enjoy this course on a personal level because it uses very lo-fi technology, paper, which can go from explaining why a one-edged piece of twisted paper could lead you on a journey of complex maths and discovery. Hello. Everyone, it's, delighted, it's delightful to welcome you to the first ever Future, Future Learn Festival of Learning. Uh, and we're here today uh, to listen to um, Lord David Putnam uh, give his views on uh, the future of learning uh, and the impact of uh, the changes that are happening in the world uh, on learning. Uh, but uh, I've taken um, the privilege of a few minutes to begin this festival by talking a little bit about FutureLearn. Uh, and um, I'm gonna share uh, some slides uh, and talk for about 10 minutes or so. Um, and then I'll introduce uh, Lord Putnam. And I'd also ask you to uh, start thinking up a few questions because we're hoping to save some time at the end uh, for questions that we can put to Lord Putnam as well. Um, but I'm chief executive of FutureLearn, a company that we established uh, just under eight years ago. Our purpose is to transform access to education for people all over the world. And we were established by the organization that uh, probably has done as much towards that lofty ambition as anyone, certainly in a UK context, the Open University which founded FutureLearn uh, at the end of 2012 as the British response to MOOCs, building on its now 50-year heritage of world-leading research and teaching uh, in online learning uh, and uh, distance learning. We built uh, a platform, FutureLearn, uh, to be accessible on every device, and to bring in high quality user experience to make learning fun and make it simple and intuitive. And we were particularly excited by the collaborative nature of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. And so when we built FutureLearn, uh, we didn't just want it to be a means by which people would distribute videos and quizzes. We wanted it to be an area where people came together to learn with each other and indeed learn from each other by interacting with each other against questions, stimulus provoked by the courses we were creating. And over the years, we've built up partnerships with universities all over the world, now a quarter of the world's top universities, deliver courses on FutureLearn. And we've attracted millions and millions of learners from all over the world with a strong base in the UK, but learners in every country on the globe. And our philosophy has been about breaking down learning into manageable chunks to make it more accessible and flexible, but also enabling people to re-stack their learning into uh, new forms of qualification. And we're trying to drive innovation in the way that people uh, gain qualifications and learn throughout their lives. And a thread that the Open University ensured we had from the very beginning was quality. 
Uh, we've made sure that our courses are not just video lectures with quizzes attached, but crafted learning experiences that use our platform and its social learning pedagogy to deliver the best results for learners. And recently, we introduced ratings and reviews of our courses. And we're incredibly proud that of the first 25,000 or so reviews, which came in in just a few weeks, uh, well over 90% uh, were either four or five star. But I thought I'd give uh, a little history lesson, uh, as this is uh, quite a momentous day for FutureLearn, introducing its first festival of learning, and take us back to when we launched our first holding page in December 2012, when we had no learners. It took us uh, about nine months to build the platform, and when we launched, we had 75,000 learners. The path to our first million felt endless, but in January 2015, we launched uh, a rapid response course to the Ebola crisis, working with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine that attracted on its own over 20,000 people, a significant proportion from the affected areas of West Africa. And this started to open our eyes to what we could do with public health uh, information and dissemination. We powered towards our second million quite quickly, driven by the phenomenal success of a course called Understanding IELTS from the British Council, which on its own attracted 450,000 people. Our five million came in December 2016 about three years after we launched our uh, first courses. Uh, and by that stage, we've now started to deliver not just short courses, but full online degrees. First with Deakin University in Australia, and then with Coventry University. By the time we were hitting 7 million in January 2018, we'd started to work with governments in the UK initially, but now also in Australia to deliver uh, Study UK and now the Study Australia campaign, uh, encouraging and enabling people to learn for free from that country's top institutions uh, and take their first steps to studying in that country or with those uh, institutions. And then in May 2019, uh, our next bit of big news we took a £50 million investment from Australian jobs marketplace SEEP coming alongside the Open University as a 50-50 shareholder and securing FutureLearn's future uh, and enabling much more significant investment to enable us to grow. And then at the end of last year, we were very proud to welcome our 10 million learner. But then the world changed and uh, early this year, as we started to see the spread of COVID-19 through China, we went back to our colleagues at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and asked them to create a course faster than we'd ever created one before. And their course on COVID-19 presented by world leading experts in uh, infectious diseases and coronavirus uh, attracted um, over 200,000 people to uh, that first run uh, and uh, very high completion rates, an extraordinary course that has delivered so much education, training, uh, information uh, to people all around the world. We also rapidly started to work with other providers uh, in healthcare. Uh, so with St. George's, um, we built a course on managing COVID-19 in general practice. With the University of Edinburgh, we built a course called uh, Critical Care, Understanding and Application, targeting professionals working uh, in hospitals or coming back to work as part of the response to the crisis. And uh, we were very proud of this quote from Professor Andrew Elder, President of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. 
there can be little doubt that this resource will help to save lives in many parts of the world. And just recently, we've launched a course called uh, COVID-19 uh, Psychological First Aid um, with Public Health England. And during this week, uh, there are two sessions uh, that may be of interest. For our healthcare response, educators from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the University of Edinburgh, uh, FIND and St. George's are doing a panel on Friday at 11 a.m. Uh, and if you want to uh, know more about the psychological impact of COVID, uh, then for teachers in particular, there's a session on mental well-being for educators and students on Friday at 10 a.m. We also identified quite early that there was no course on FutureLearn on how to teach online. And so for the first time, FutureLearn built its own course. We used our world-class team of learning designers, building a course in a matter of days while working remotely. We pulled in support from an incredible network of mentors from across our partnerships, including Diana Lorillard from the UCL Institute of Education. And we created a rapid course without lots of expensive video designed to provoke conversation between teachers. And designed to give them articles, provoke questions, and give them practical uh, steps that they could take away to start teaching online quickly. This course attracted um, well over 50,000 people. Uh, and at the end of week one, they did a word, word cloud when they asked people how they felt about the prospect of online teaching. And while many were excited, you can see how challenged, challenging, and overwhelmed and anxious some people were. By the end of week two, there was a much more confident um, and motivated uh, and inspired uh, reaction, just showing the power of what you can do with social learning uh, in a variety of different environments. We also launched FutureLearn Campus to allow our universities to deliver courses to their own students, FutureLearn Schools to enable schools all around the world to use FutureLearn courses as well. We've worked with the UK government uh, to be part of the uh, skills um, platform, the skills toolkit that they've developed for people who've been furloughed or uh, made unemployed during the crisis. As I said, we've been working with Australia to welcome students from all over the world to come uh, to study with its uh, institutions. Uh, and we've also helped people all over the world with a wide variety of board and busting or skills development or personal development courses. And so as a result, we've seen huge growth in learners, uh, smashing through first our 11 million barrier in that March, then 12 million uh, in April, uh, and now um, 13 million. Uh, the 13 millionth learner joined us on Friday um, and uh, we're powering forward with a range of professional micro-credentials as well as significant growth of all of our short courses, all of our degrees. So as we go into this um, festival of learning, uh, we are extremely optimistic uh, about the impact we can have not just in a post-COVID world, uh, but actually in moving towards that overall ambition of FutureLearn to really transform access to education for people all over the world. Because now that digital technologies like FutureLearn exist, there's no excuse for people to be shut out from those buildings that they would love to learn from. Okay, uh, thank you for um, indulging that introduction from me, uh, but we're now on to uh, the main event, which is uh, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Lord David Putnam, uh, award-winning uh, film producer, of course, 
um, of uh, films, uh, legendary films such as Chariots of Fire, Local Hero, The Killing Fields, uh, and for a UK audience, I was just chatting with him previously about one of the first films on Channel 4 that I remember, Patang Yang Kipperbank. Um, but alongside that amazing wealth of film, uh, David has been uh, very active in education for many years, uh, including uh, chairing the National Film and Television School for many years, and when I first met him, Chancellor of the Open University. And I remember being uh, given the chance to present to uh, Lord Putnam when FutureLearn was probably about a year old. And I remember him being full of encouragement uh, and praise uh, and really making sure that my and my team's ambition remained really high because he saw the potential of what we were doing. And for the past year, uh, Lord Putnam has been chair of a parliamentary select committee looking at the impact of digital technology and that uh, committee's report is going to be published next week. So with no further ado, let me pass over to Lord Putnam uh, for his uh, presentation. Thanks, Simon, very, very much indeed. And you're right. I mean, when, when we first looked at the potential of future loan, it was very exciting. You and your team have done a, a brilliant job. I, I really mean that. Well, welcome everybody to uh, gorgeous West Cork, which is where I am. I've been in this room almost solidly for, I think, 13 weeks now. Uh, I'm getting used to it. I hope it doesn't become the whole of the rest of my life, but it's a, a not a bad way of, uh, of communicating at all. Um, I want to pull together a number of threads, and I hope they're all coherent. But what's certain is the world's never presented itself with more challenges uh, which we to, to navigate. Uh, the impacts of the pandemic, both health and socioeconomic, diminished employment opportunities, racial tension, political tension, the re-emergence of Brexit, and sitting out there, there's the mother of them all, uh, climate change. So this is a time when, frankly, our students, our learners, have got a lot to contend with. Um, I've called my chat this morning, Ed Education's Darwinian Moment. Why? Because I think that's exactly what it is. Just as after the publication of The Origin of the Species, there was no going back. We had to deal with the world as Darwin had revealed it. I think that the post-COVID world is going to be an extraordinarily exciting place, but a very, very challenging place. And as I said, our job is to take our students and help them, help them recreate a map in such a way they can actually understand it. At the moment, they must be looking at the most extraordinary, confused and confusing uh, set of options for the future. So that's, as I see it, that's our role. It's an important role. A few years ago, I attended a seminar by Larry Summers. Larry Summers was the US uh, Secretary of the Treasury under uh, President Obama. And he said this, he said, change takes far longer than you expect, but when it does occur, it happens faster than you ever believe possible. Now at the time, he was talking about the 2008 financial crisis. And he made the point that by 2006, people kind of knew there was a problem, maybe a real problem. Two th nothing happened. 2007, again, nothing happened. And everyone began to relax their guard when it hit in 2008, it was twice as bad as any prediction that they've made prior to that. And my argument really is that we as human beings are not great at planning. We're not great at looking ahead. And the truth, as we all now know, is that this type of pandemic has been predicted for quite a long time and we've done almost nothing about it. A um, couple of years after Larry Summers, I uh, spent a morning in the company of President Xi. Only ever happened once, I promise you. I was given the job of showing him around London's cultural uh, uh, glories. Um, and he said this, he'd said it actually a couple of years earlier, we cannot dress up other people's yesterdays and our own tomorrows. He was obviously referring entirely to China and the way that China viewed the, 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 uh, the future. Today, I'd argue, we can't even dress up our own yesterdays, pretending that they're going to reflect our own tomorrows. We really are navigating a very, very difficult uh, world. About the same time that President Xi was speaking, this piece came out, uh, the Gallup survey, the largest survey Gallup had ever done, it's worth mentioning, that said that 96% of college principals believe the institution is successfully preparing young people, 14% of recent college graduates agreed with them, less than 12% of business leaders believe the graduates they employ have the skills they need. That was a most shocking indictment frankly of uh, particularly the higher education system or its failure to communicate 
I've heard all sorts of excuses about the fact that needless to say our job is to is to, uh, to educate the whole person. Of course, that's true. But this level of misunderstanding between students, uh, schools, and employers is it's cosmic, and it's something we can't afford to pretend doesn't exist. So equipping ourselves for the future has become a big issue. Uh, a couple of years ago, I made a series for RTE here in Ireland about the impact of the digital world. Um, and what I discovered was even when you lay out what the challenges and opportunities are, you get met with something close to incredulity. Just look at the students at the end of this very short clip. There's something like 70% of the jobs that you'll be doing 15 years from now do not at present exist. We don't even know what they are. So you need to be collaborative, flexible, smart, and absolutely able to adapt to change. So what I think the school's trying to prepare you for, I hope, and in fact, I know it, is a world of constant change. I'm 75 years old. I'm learning stuff every single day, and I do it by teaching. Now, my father had retired 10 years earlier. I've got another 10 years of me, at least. Some of you in this room will be working at aged 100. I promise you. I promise you. So just think about this. It's a very, very, very different gig. And what the school's doing is preparing you for that, which is fantastic. David has created his own online classroom where he shares his expertise in filmmaking and engages with students globally. All possible because of an interactive link between his home in West Cork and universities all over the world. Interactive digital learning, the sort provided by David, is giving learners access to expertise and knowledge never before so readily available. You know, I use the phrase, and I think it's a fair one, what's happened is distance has been destroyed. And we are proving what's possible. And what I still find staggering is even after three years of doing it, unless you're on the receiving end and have been enjoying it, people still think it's very gee whiz. I don't think it's particularly gee whiz at all. I'll see you all on the 11th. Thanks very, very much for your time, your attention and everything else. Okay, so that's what, uh, that's what I do. I teach at uh, half a dozen universities around the world and it's been fantastic. I've got BT and Cisco between them to thank for this. Uh, they put together a system that no one believed possible, but it's extraordinary fun. In fact, it's become a hobby as much as, as anything else. Simon just mentioned that I spent the last year working and chairing a select committee on the impact of digital technology on tech, on democracy. It's been an extraordinary year. Uh, we've come to a number of conclusions that will be published next Monday. Um, but worth saying that where we come out is the need to literally knock together the heads of the Department of Education and the big tech companies, because both of them are equally responsible for the fact that we are not advancing and moving as quickly or as deftly as we could. Let me give you just two simple examples, um, if you like, parallels. With the Department of Education, it's been a bit like giving every kid a bicycle and omitting to tell them about the highway code. So they come up to the first, the first uh, intersection, they look up, there's three lights, a yellow, a green, a red light, they don't know what the lights are about. That's how, in a way, dumb it's been. The complete failure to teach digital literacy, to, to get young people to understand what being computer literate really means has been a, a really, in my view, quite an extraordinary failure. We go into it in great detail, over 66,000 words uh, in the report. In terms of the tech companies, well, again, the analogy there, I think, would be seatbelts. Um, it took a long, long, long time to persuade motor manufacturers to install seatbelts. During that time, millions died. Um, the, seat, the motor manufacturers argued over which design of seatbelt and everything else. The truth was, a guy called Niels Bolan, had invented the perfect three-point seatbelt very early on. It was equipped into the Volvo cars. And when Volvo started selling in great numbers, the rest of the industry woke up. It needs a similar moment, if you like, in terms of the safety and security of the web and for the big, big businesses, Google, Facebook, and the rest, to wake up and, and face up to the responsibilities of the enormous power that they've got. So that's what I've been doing. Um, Bruce Springsteen put it beautifully uh, years ago. As I see it, with data exploitation, with the digital world, nobody wins unless everybody wins. And I feel that very, very strongly. So our report really is about securing democracy, understanding the fragility, and getting the tech companies and the government to understand that unless they can find a way of working together 
and embracing the opportunities and the, and the challenges, we're going to have a problem. It all in the end comes down to trust. And I'm going to run a slightly longer clip right now to try and illustrate exactly what I mean. This is a three minute, 26 cl uh, second clip. It's taken from Ken Burns' brilliant uh, series on the Roosevelt's. But please watch this. 5,000 banks have failed. Nine million savings accounts have been wiped out. And Roosevelt declares a national bank holiday. And for several days, the country operates without cash. And the expectation is that when the banks are reopened in the following week, there's going to be a massive withdrawal. On Sunday evening, March 12th, eight days after his inauguration, the new president spoke to the American people. Some 60 million Americans gathered around their radios. Let me make it clear to you that the banks will take care of all needs. And it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime. In less than 15 minutes, he explained how the banking system was supposed to work. He explained how it had failed. Some of our bankers had shown themselves either incompetent or dishonest in their handling of the people's funds. They had used the money entrusted to them in speculations and unwise loans. He explained what his administration and Congress had done. This bank holiday is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency necessary to meet the situation. Remember that no sound bank is a dollar worse off than it was when it closed its doors last week. And then he spoke to them as an equal. And he said that all that we've done in Washington will mean nothing without the support of the American people. After all, there is an element in the readjustment of our financial system more important than currency, more important than gold. And that is the confidence of the people themselves. Confidence and courage are the essentials of success in carrying out our plan. Let us unite in banishing fear. It is your problem, my friend, your problem no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States has spoken to you from the White House in Washington, D.C. And in 14 and a half minutes, he utterly changed the mindset of Americans. When he says in that first fireside chat, hoarding has become a terribly unfashionable pastime, please take your money out from under your mattresses and redeposit it in the banks when they reopen. People actually did it. The same people who had been lining up, pushing each other out of the way to get their money out of the banks, they now, after listening to the new president on the radio, they lined up to redeposit the money. Now that's leadership. There'll be pennies from heaven. Capitalism, one of Roosevelt's advisors remembered, was saved in eight days. Okay, so in the end, it all comes down to trust, trust and leadership. There's a reason why I uh, entitled our report, The Resurrection of Trust. I was originally going to call it Renewal, but the truth is I thought we've reached such a low ebb that nothing less than the resurrection of trust is going to actually see us through. Um, and it shows what can be done with a crisis. Without trust, everything's possible. Without it, in my judgment, nothing is possible. And when you look at the nature of the crisis, it's pretty alarming. This is uh, the impact, according to the OECD, this is the impact of COVID-19 on education. 1.38 billion young people have missed out. The very people who most need a leg up in life. And that's the, uh, that's frankly the picture we're looking at. Uh, currently, before COVID-19, 18, almost 19 billion a, a year was being spent on the uh, EdTech. The truth is, looking forward, 
the education market projects that that figure will be 350 billion, 350 billion. What that says to me is that whatever our problem is going to be, they won't be the lack of capital. Simon was able to raise 50 million to, to inject an enormous boost into um, future learning. That sort of capital will be available. And without doubt, incidentally, we're going to make mistakes. There will be mistakes. But it gives us the opportunity to begin to discover where the center of gravity is. We call it blended, don't we? Where the center of gravity is between online and offline learning. What things can be done and done even better online? Where do we require absolutely face-to-face -face traditional teaching? And it's finding that nexus, I think, is the really extraordinary challenge uh, for all of us. And what makes uh, this a very, actually, a very exciting moment. Um, this speech was given by the president of Tencent Education recently. Uh, I believe the integration of information technology in education be further accelerated. Now, the truth is, when he said that, or when he, I'm sure, when he thought that, that seemed like a pretty kind of prescient thought. The truth is, today, it's a statement of the absolute obvious. And incidentally, Tencent will be a big player as we go forward. Without any doubt, they have the resources, they've got the skills, they're very well placed to become a major, major player in our world of uh, international learning. Other people have, have, uh, have really stepped up. I think Gordon Brown has understood his very very special relationship with the UN uh, as, as envoy. And he's had a lot to say recently, which is good. And as I said, the OECD report on post-COVID education is, well, it's quite a chilling document, but they have nailed both the uh, challenges and to an extent the opportunities. Lastly, I'll just bring things back to the, um, the local, the immediate. Um, I've been teaching, one of the universities I teach at the University of Sunderland, where I was chancellor before going to or being transferred to the OU. Um, my students there were just doing their graduate films as lockdown started. I showed them the film of an Iranian filmmaker who'd been uh, under house arrest. And then he made an extraordinary film which went on to win a prize at Cannes. I said, look, guys, don't tell me it can't be done. I know you're in lockdown, plow on and you're going to have to work on and make your graduate films and bless them, they did. So here's two short clips. First of all, Katie Stubbs talking about the challenge as she saw it and, has, and as she dealt with it. Stubbs. I'm 19 and I am studying screen performance at Sunderland University. Um, for me, being lucky enough to gain a place on the Putnam Scholarship has meant a huge, great deal and has given me a big, big confidence boost um, into thinking more professionally about the industry that I want to go into. Um, and I am proud of my documentary, um, Cover 19 Behind Closed Doors. My favourite lecture was about identity and creativity and sort of seeing yourself in a film that you produce. For me, the Putnam Scholarship Programme, it's more so opened my eyes to, to be able to see that getting into the industry isn't as hard as people may think. Um, and I think as long as you have the drive and the passion to want to do what you want to do that bad i think you will get there so the really important thing there was the films that were made the film resulted from all those students were not earth shattering i've worked with better student films but the self-belief that it engendered was extraordinary the fact they could do it and did it and succeeded and the films were shown, shown to the vice chancellor and everyone else at the university uh to a level i think a fair level of acclaim the whole experience was a learning experience in every sense, but also an experience of self of development, self confidence. Here's a two minute clip from Katie's film. Well, I think it's well worth watching, and consider the conditions under which it was made. Save more lives. COVID nineteen. Protect our NHS. Key workers. Their exceptional public service and sacrifice will not be forgotten. Stay at home. Protect our NHS and save lives. What exactly is COVID-19? When will lockdown end? When will life be back to normal? 
or when will I get to see my loved ones again? And these are all questions which we ask ourselves day in, day out. But the fact is, none of us know the answers to the questions that we're asking. The history books will talk of now, that time the world stood still. When every family stayed at home, waved out from window sills, at those they loved but could not hold, because they loved them so. Yet, whilst they did, they noticed all the flowers start to grow. The sun came out, they can recall, and windows rainbows filled. They kicked a football in their yards until the night drew in. They walked each day, but not too close, that time the world stood still. When people walked straight down the roads that once the cars did fill. They clapped on Thursdays from their doors, they cheered for the brave. For people who would risk their lives so others could be saved. The schools closed down, they missed their friends, they missed their teachers so. Their mums and dads helped with their work, they helped their minds to grow. But history books will talk of them, now adults fully grown. Those little boys and girls back then, the ones who stayed at home. They'll tell you that they fixed this world, of all they would fulfil. The rainbow children, building dreams, they dreamed whilst time stood still. So Katie and all her fellow students did a fantastic job. I wish I had the time to show you, included in her film, using her mobile phone, were beautiful interviews with her family, very, very emotional interviews with her family. So it was a challenge and a challenge we successfully, I think, uh, overcome in everyone's terms. I'll leave you with one last slide, if I may. Everyone's hero, the most trusted man probably in the last 30 years, Nelson Mandela. And he said, in order to build our future, will be required to exceed our own expectations. And the key word there is our. And I'll leave you with this thought. We are required to exceed our, our expectations simply because in order to deliver the expectations of our students through what is an unparalleled series of crises, if you like, only we can guide them through it. So we've got to exceed our ex expectations in order for them to even secure their expectations. Thanks very, very much for listening to me. And as Simon said, I'm very happy to try and answer a few questions. Thank you. Uh, David, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful um, speech presentation, those uh, fantastic films. Um, and uh, I think you can uh, uh, imagine the applause ringing out around the world. Um, we do have, um, we think hundreds of viewers at the moment uh, and some of the people who've uh, said where they're from. So we've got uh, someone in Tokyo, someone in Cape Town, someone in Jakarta. Uh, we've got someone in the Netherlands, Vancouver, Sydney, Nigeria, Melbourne, Lusaka in Zambia and Uzbekistan, uh, as well as lots of people across uh, the UK. So um, uh, in some ways it replicates a FutureLearn course uh, and uh, that amazing experience you have of people learning together and learning from each other as a global community. Um, so we have had um, uh, we have our first question, and then I have a few others. But please, um, if you'd like to ask questions, pop them in the chat uh, for either the event or the uh, stage. And this question, uh, David, is from Jonathan Vernon. What genuine provision is being made to ensure that young people have access to the internet? Too many do not have a laptop or Wi-Fi at home, and not all have a phone. And a phone isn't always the best platform for learning either. Um, <clears throat> what provision? It's very patchy. There's no question, Jonathan's right, and that, that's implicit in the question. What I would say, and certainly here in Ireland, and I showed you the um, what we've done in Skibbereen, and we did it locally, I've got to say, uh, was develop the idea of uh, broadband as a, a human right. It's, not, it's a utility. And indeed, I would argue, frankly, that Netflix, free, um, uh, Facebook and the others are also, in a sense, utilities. So the, the, the very word utility, I think, sums it up. It is something that we should have access to exactly the same way as water and electricity. And of course, anyone without access to water, anyone without access to electricity is massively disadvantaged. The same is absolutely true of broadband. Um, interesting enough, I'm doing a series of uh, seminars in, in mixed locations 
bringing in guests. Uh, this will uh, certainly appeal to Simon. And what I've said to the guests is, all I need, guys, and I happen to be guys, is uh, you, a laptop, and a decent broadband connection. And we can connect you up with anybody anywhere. But without it, yes, of course, uh, massive disadvantage can only result. Okay, um, so we've had a few more coming in now. So from Susan Batour, um, why are so many university lecturers so reluctant to embrace online, in your opinion? Whoa, Susan, <clears throat> $64,000 question. My own honest answer is that the discussion very, very rapidly becomes about them. It doesn't become about learning or learners. It becomes about the impact on an individual's career, their own sense of themselves within the learning community they live, they live and work in. Uh, and I'm afraid, this is, I'm, I'm really very crit critical on this issue. I'm afraid that most educators have not looked across the horizon and seen that they have responsibilities to their students, which exceed their own immediate expectations for themselves, which is exactly why I finish actually with Mandela. We've got to exceed our expectations of ourselves, our comfort zones, in order to create a comfort zone for our students. That's a must. I guess I might uh, add a supplementary to that. I, I guess um, I, I imagine across the world of education, in particular high, particularly higher education, there is the question of, are things going to go back to where they were? Um, and uh, I obviously don't believe they will. Uh, I think just from the very title of your um, uh, presentation today, uh, I don't believe you do. But uh, I guess, um, how do you see the worlds of online and face-to-face -face, um, coexisting in the future? Well, two things, Simon, I'll say. Number one, I do believe they will coexist. I certainly don't think this is a binary situation, a binary option. Um, my advice would be, if we're going to fully understand where we land with this kind of, with a blended offering, we should do it via, this is quite, this would be contentious, we should do it via a digital first assumption. Because if we don't do that, the temptation to slip back into our old tried and tested ways will become overwhelming. So unless we actually push out the, the, the opportunity that, uh, that online offers and find out where it fails or where it doesn't work, and then under, and underpin that with the things we know how to do, that is where I think we'll arrive quickest and best at a proper, a proper blended approach. But if we say, if we, if we look at uh, online as a temporary option, something that, yeah, it was cute, but you know, just now we had a snag on the technology, I don't wanna do, I don't wanna do that, then we've got a problem. Years and years and years ago, Simon, I made the point that, that the sort of learning that you and I dream on, of has gotta be as simple for a teacher as walking into the classroom and turning the light on. The moment you create complexity, the moment you create an interruption in the process, a teacher becomes extremely vulnerable. And you can't blame teachers, be they at university or primary schools, for being nervous of interrupted lessons. That is not a great way to, uh, to teach. But uh, I think we're rapidly reaching a point where we, where we can create very reliable uh, offerings. And as I say, we must be prepared to make some mistakes. There will be no lack of capital invested in this area. There'll be some winners and be some losers, but the winners ultimately, if we get this right, will be our students. Our students now, our students in 2030, our students in 2040. Um, so from Amrit Pal Gill, uh, thank you so much, David. I feel like many firms don't give their staff time to seek further education and other learning. What are your thoughts? The UK does have the longest hours in Europe after all. Uh, Amrit, I'm a, a big fan, and I, I know it's been discussed for years, of what uh, Chikinda Arden's looking at in, in New Zealand, which is the four-day week. But I'm only a fan of the four-day week if the fifth day does become a learning day. So I, how we create an obligation and an incentive to learn, I'm not sure. I mean, that's quite an interesting social problem. But I absolutely agree with you that given the pressures and the pace of change, we ought to be able to breathe, and in order to do that, we probably need a fourth, a fifth day of each week, rather than doing the same thing we do for four days uh, as, as a learning day. Quite complex, but you know, I was sat in Parliament and watched the um, the minimum wage uh, legislation go through, and I remember I won't name which party opposed it, but I remember a party saying it was the end of the world as they knew it, and the economic collapse could only follow if we had a minimum wage. 
the same party today is protecting and actually even increasing the minimum wage. So I don't, I'm not one of those people that believe that things are possible. The four day week is possible, but devising a means by which the four day week is a productive week because the fifth day is a learning week is a challenge, but a very, very possible challenge to take on. Okay, um, I'm gonna to go to Michelle Fuller. Um, the stress for many educators is a lack of training understanding of how to use e-learning and online pedagogy with confidence and ability to transform their teaching, learning and assessment. It's a challenge for both teachers and students. Not all students are necessarily initially competent or connected. It is surely not always a lack of ability to engage, interact or due to their focus on self. So this is a challenge, I guess, back on, um, well, I guess, reflecting the challenges that educators are finding at the moment. Uh, and I guess to some degree answered by your, we need to make these technologies much, much simpler. Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. And, it, and that will only happen, I say, when the government, uh, in, in now terms, in the UK, uh, England's terms, the Department of Education, actually engage with the, um, uh, with the big tech companies using the clout they do have. And they have a lot of clout. At the moment, we've got a weird situation, in, in, certainly in England, where I think the government's rather scared of the tech companies. Uh, they see them as a kind of, even the ones who people are critical see them as a necessary evil. They need to engage with each other for their own long-term success and indeed maybe even survival. But um, yeah, I, of course it's not going to be easy. No, nothing's ever easy, but we've had this fantastic wake up. and We've got a choice. We can either collapse under the weight of the problem we've been presented with, or we can grab it and learn from it and develop from it. And I have to say, in terms of the uh, simplicity of uh, platforms and technology, et cetera, um, it's one of the things when we started FutureLearn, um, we looked at the variety of learning management systems out there and various educational tools available. And we just thought they were so cluttered, poorly designed in many cases. And, you know, we, I remember us going to educators and saying and being asked, OK, well, we'd like to be able to change the design for this feature, this feature, this feature. And we said, no, you know, we're going to handle the design and the technology. We want you to do the teaching. So actually, there's very little freedom to change the look and feel of a future learn course. And that's highly deliberate. Um, so uh, Chris Johnson, um, David, I grew up in Dublin in a family of nine. We couldn't afford higher education but I've spent 30 years pursuing learning and seized online opportunities with delight. But the intellectual snobbery persists with many dismissing online learning as trivial and frivolous. How can we change that perspective? Chris, it's a really great question. I mean, I live in West Cork, you were in Dublin. I spent a lot of time in Dublin. I was at a conference, so a little conference like this, with um, the people from Trinity, uh, literally last week, um, looking at how Trinity accepts what it, it Trinity, even Trinity, which pretty you know, uh, sees itself as a very elite university, accepts the fact that things have to change. How to do it whilst retaining their sense of themselves, and this would be true of Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, the same, is tough. Uh, we did offer a number of solutions, but even let's say at Trinity, within, uh, within the Irish context, even Trinity knows that things can't continue as they are uh, that it has to reach out. It's already reaching out to disadvantaged students, in, in fairness, in a quite a quite an interesting and aggressive way. Um, but I think just the idea of being a lifelong learner. Look, I'm 79 years old. I've learned more in the last year chairing this committee on uh, technology and democracy than I think in any other year of my life. And I find it genuinely exciting. And can I just say one thing about a, a committee, in case it sounds I'm being too pedantic. It'll come out next week. And, uh, Lord's Committee and its unanimous report. A US Lord's Committee sits for a year and takes evidence. This is not a lot of people bringing their prejudices to play. We took evidence and our report is, um, is built around that evidence. And the overwhelming evidence is of an extraordinary opportunity that at the moment is not being taken advantage of. And if anything, the level of a pandemic of mistrust has been created. And that affects education as much as it affects any other area of democracy. So an entire chapter, and I beg you, if you've got time to read it, an entire chapter of our report is all about digital learning and, and the relationship of education with us, us as, a, as human beings. David, I know you've um, also um, 
uh, study the impact of artificial intelligence uh, on societies uh, in some detail. And uh, a few months ago, before the pandemic, um, the central part of my speeches would be that the disruption to jobs uh, caused by AI, digitization of sectors, globalization, was something that needed to be addressed by educational institutions. Right? Universities needed to stop seeing their audiences as just 18 to 25 year old traditional student age and think about all those people whose work and lives were going to be disrupted by the impact of technology. Um, I guess the last few months has just taken that argument um, to the stars, hasn't it? Um, absolutely. I mean, I sat, as you know, Simon, I sat for a couple of years ago on the House of Lords AI committee. And the really odd thing there was we looked at the opportunities and the challenges. And the only time we divided in a serious way was over the title, was whether to put a question mark after the <laughs> opportunities and challenges of AI. Uh, I'm happy to say the people like me who wanted the question mark won. But it was literally, it was a quite a big fight to uh, to get that through. This, this is an interesting moment. I mean, of all the periods to be in the world of education, this is it. We're right in the middle of things. And the way I used to try and explain it, and still explain it, is try to imagine a world that fails in education. How is your health service going to be funded? Where is anything going to work? Where will your pension come from? We are the sine qua non of the entire social system. Without it, it can't. Without us, it it has to falter and actually probably will collapse. When will politicians of all parties wake up and realize we are the only game in town and understand that we have challenges, we have problems, we have there's a lot of complexity, but unless they back us, we can't deliver the society they want. Uh, I think I'm going to ask uh, one last question, uh, although they've been flooding in recently. Um, so this is from uh, Penny Carvalho-Smith, and because um, you've answered all the others so well, I'm going to save you one of the hardest ones now. Um, any thoughts on practical ways of building trust in a world now so lacking in trust? It's a great question, Penny. In our report, we refer back to a thing called the Nolan Principles. And I beg you, if you do read the report, look at this carefully. The Nolan Principles were hammered out by the John Major government at the time of a, what was called a, the cash for questions crisis, where it really did look as though parliament was on the rocks. People were be, they discovered that MP was being paid for asking questions. The Nolan principles are developed. Look at the Nolan principles. What we've said in our report is we've tested all our recommendations against the Nolan principles. What do the Nolan principles require? Truthfulness, integrity. These are not kind of extraordinary things. They're things we actually expect of each other all the time. So, as I say, without building trust, we get nowhere. Nolan offered a route to trust building. And if I'm absolutely honest and critical, I'm afraid we've had successive governments who have chosen to nod at Nolan without implementing Nolan. This morning, just before I came down here, I was listening to Mark Carney on the radio, Radio 4. Uh, Mark Carney is not up for election. You listen to the man, you trust him. You know that he's telling you the truth, and you know that something wise is being said. When are we going to return to wisdom? When are we going to return to trust? When are we going to listen to people telling us things that we think we can absolutely believe in? Because the truth is, in the COVID-19 crisis, we, the citizens, delivered. And I'm afraid many, many, many of our leaders failed to. We've got to rebuild from that low base. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to leave uh, the final word on that to Michelle Fuller, who said, uh, this is such an exciting conversation about change. There's opportunity and positive progress for all. Very inspiring, and thank you. And that is, David, the, uh, the tenor of uh, all the comments uh, that I'm reading. Um, so uh, I'm just going to say uh, to you, thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts, share your insights with us. Um, and um, that, was, uh, that was a brilliant session. Thank you so much. Thanks, Simon. And thanks, everyone else, for listening. I'm truly grateful. And for everyone else, um, so I gave a couple of plugs to other uh, FutureLearn Festival sessions. Uh, so as well as the healthcare response session on Friday at 11, uh, the, site, the mental well-being for educators and students on Friday at 10. Uh, if you're interested in that How to Teach Online course, um, then you can hear from some of the mentors who are on that course uh, during educating the educators session on Thursday at 10 a.m.
We and can. on Wednesday, the fantastic learning uh, design team are running learning design masterclasses throughout the day on Wednesday. So if you've enjoyed this opening session, please um, make your way to some of those other sessions through the week. And thank you very much for your time, your attention and your engagement. Thank you very much. Outside of higher education and of, of other formal uh, education, we're going to see online learning uh, and online um, pedagogies coming in to play within industry. Again, we can see that with some of the big industry players like IBM, Amazon. Uh, they're, in, they're investing in uh, education for their, for their staff and their employees. And I think we're going to see more organizations uh, utilizing online learning. Uh, the current model is often that people are spending a number of days attending workshops uh, that, that disrupts their, their whole work process by, by making uh, certainly the theoretical elements available online that staff can do in their own time and then perhaps coming for shorter workshops where they actually uh, participate in activities that uh, reinforce that, that theory. We're going to see those kind of changes. So it was just in time training for, for industry and industry requirements will become um, a, a much bigger user of online education. So away from higher education, online learning gives many more organisations such as NGOs and businesses the opportunity to upskill their employees or their target audiences. And so I think that there's potential for collaboration between universities and other organisations. So perhaps it's not so much that online learning will take away um, students from higher education, but that there will be opportunities for more authentic collaborations and um, curriculum development going forward. Outside of the higher education context, online learning can be useful to people across their lifespan from childhood right through to older adults post-retirement for any purpose, whether that be employment related, upskilling, credentialing, retraining, but also for reasons that are personal and spiritual and to do with hobbies and self-actualization in the widest possible form. Online learning can cater for any learning, for any person, for any reason.